Today we're going to talk about the touch of Christmas. And you know, probably one of the best known, perhaps most beloved passages of Scripture read at Christmas time is the account of the birth of Jesus in Luke 2, 1 to 20. And today I'd like to key in on a part of that. We have a very special guest who's going to share that passage of Scripture with us today. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So there you have it. We knew we were going to have some of the, well, I thought we were going to have more of the kids in here with us today. But anyway, I thought that was kind of a nice way. Mark actually suggested uh, that we start with that. And I actually appreciate that very much. Because, you know, I imagine that almost everybody here this morning, you're, you're all familiar with Charlie Brown, right? Now, some of the younger ones, I don't even know if it's in the papers anymore. Newspaper, what's that? Does anybody have a newspaper? Right? So you may not be as familiar with Charlie Brown if you're really young as, as some of the rest of us, but you, you remember the characters in the Charlie Brown comic strip. And a number of years ago, the strip pictured you loosely walking up to Charlie Brown, be, Brown before Christmas and I think we even have that Christmas strip right up here, okay? I'll let you read that while I commentate here just a little bit. So anyway, Lucy walks up to Charlie Brown just before Christmas and says, Charlie Brown, since it's Christmas, I suggest that we lay aside all our differences and be friends for this season of the year. Charlie Brown goes, that's a great idea, Lucy, but why does it have to be just at this time of the year? Why can't we be friends all year long? And Lucy looks at him with only that look that Lucy can give, right? and says, what are you, a fanatic or something? Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if we actually started to practice the things that we hear and sing about at Christmas time? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we would take how Christmas touches us and take it with us all the way through this year, next year, and beyond? And when it comes to thinking about Christmas and how it should affect us, let our minds drift to the words of that Christmas hymn, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the word repeat, words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Yet pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. That was written by Henry W. Longfellow. You know, it isn't only peace that we should be striving for, though. What of all five of the traditional themes of the Advent season? Imagine if all who talk of peace on earth and joy, hope, and love to the world and living it for and like Jesus actually started to practice it in everyday life and encouraged others to practice it as well. Just think how different our world would become if all who talk about and give lift service to these things actually began to be those things and encourage it and live it before others. This world would be a significantly better place. Someone compared Christmas to skydiving. Are you ready for this? Christmas is like that sense of freedom and excitement and exhilaration you feel when you jump out of an airplane. Actually, I would feel sheer terror, but anyway. And are free -falling, you're free-falling through the air. You feel the wind on your face and can see the beauty of God's world, his creation for miles all around. But the earth is rushing toward you. So you pull the ripcord and your parachute jerks open with a snap, right? And you hit the ground with a jolt. And for a few brief, brief moments, you felt a wonderful, nearly overwhelming exuberance, and then plop, you're on the ground, facing reality once again, back to the humdrum of everyday life. Is that what happens to us with Christmas? Christmas is wonderful, and now plop, 
we come rocketing back to earth, back to the former reality, face to face with that reality once again. What about the shepherds? What about those guys who heard the angels and saw the baby Jesus? Did that Christmas make any real lasting difference for them in life? And what about the wise men who came to worship and who brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh? I'm convinced that once they saw Jesus, their lives were never quite the same again. Jesus in the season of Advent Advent should have the same effect on us if we truly encounter Jesus, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. And I'd like to share three things with you today. I think Jesus makes all the difference in the home. There's no way that life was ever the same again for Mary and Joseph. No way! They now had a baby to take care of. And their lives changed forever. Just ask any brand new parent, is life ever the same? (laughs) Hardly. Every couple's lives change the instant they become parents. Not to mention the earthly parents of the Son of God. I mean, think about it. But anyway, I can remember when our first child, Andy, was born. I remember the look of pure joy on Kim's face as she laughed and cried all at the same time. Yes, folks, it's possible. Here was this tiny child who would be dependent on us for everything for, for, for a few years. What a great gift, yet so overwhelming right off. Then Kim had some complications that actually threatened her life, and that got really scary, even though I didn't fully grasp it at the time. And we were in the hospital with all the mo- we were in the hospital with all the modern conveniences, right? And medical equipment and expert doctors and nurses. Imagine, if you will, giving birth in a stable during biblical times without so much as a midwife, when you think about it. Kim and Andy stayed a couple extra days in the hospital, which was okay because it delayed the inevitable. You're wondering what I'm talking about. Well, that, that taking of that little guy home when everything's up to us to figure out everything, we, we got to go with it. They're not right there to say, why is he crying? You know, they, they don't, they're not there to answer us, right? It's quite a reality check as you pull away from the hospital curb. It's an amazing responsibility, but it's also pretty scary, okay? I imagine <clears throat> that Mary and Joseph felt that in a much greater way than any of us because the child they held in their arms was God's only begotten son. Talk about pressure, Right? They were responsible for raising God's child. The late Irma Bombeck in her book, Life is a Bowl of, If Life is a Bowl of Cherries, Why Am I Always in the Pits, recalled the legend of a church where the chimes rang miraculously whenever someone gave a generous gift. But the chimes hadn't rung for a very long time, even though kings and potentates had come to give gifts, give gifts of gold and silver and precious gems. But the one Christmas Eve, a little, pre- a little peasant boy came down the aisle and he knelt before the altar. And as he thought about the Christ child lying in a manger, he took off his tattered coat and he laid it on the altar. And when he did, you guessed it, the chimes rang loudly and joyously. Irma Bombeck wrote, I've heard the chimes ring too. I remember a Christmas when one of my sons brought me a piece of tattered construction paper on which he had tried to draw a picture of praying hands. And underneath the picture he had written, O come Holy Spit. A child, right? That's probably the way he had it in his head, too. When I saw that, she said, I heard the chimes ring. And I knew that a very special gift had been given. And on another Christmas, I received a shoebox all clumsily wrapped When I opened it, I found two baseball cards and a piece of gum. Again, I heard the chimes ring. And I heard the chimes ring the time when the kids got together and cleaned the garage and gave that as their Christmas present to me. (coughs) Those days are long gone, she remembered. Days when we fashioned lace doilies into snowflakes. Did you ever do that? And pipe cleaners into Christmas trees or angels. We took empty spools and we used them for candle holders. Those days are long gone. I remember little feet coming down the stairs with a handmade gift wrapped in $2 worth of wrapping paper to put underneath the Christmas tree. Those little feet now wear pantyhose and fashion boots. Little hands that used to break the piggy bank to get 59 cents to buy a Christmas gift now hold credit cards that are good in virtually any store in town. We'll have a good Christmas this year, she wrote. We'll eat too much. 
will mess up the living room and throw the warranties in the fire by mistake. We'll put bows on the dog's tail. We'll take bites out of cookies. We'll listen to Christmas songs and have a good Christmas. But Lord, what I wouldn't give to bend over just one more time and receive some toothpicks held together by library paste to hear the chimes ring just one more time. Just one more time. You see, our homes are important because it's a home in a home that we not only talk about love and trust, but we learn to live with love and trust. And we talk about the love of God, His love and His sacrifice for us, and how we show it to others and how how we offer it to one another. It's a home where we don't just talk about peace and goodwill to men, but we learn to live it. Then our children will go out into the world as ambassadors of peace. But if they don't learn peace there, they'll go out into the world angry and upset upset at themselves and everyone else. Hmm. We must not be living this and instilling it in our families nearly enough because even during this Christmas season, people seem on edge, stressed and sadly prone to quick tempers and disagreements. Kim and I went to the grocery store for the third day in a row last night. And the guy in front of us must have had a day because he really ruined the day of the two clerks that were checking us out as he was rather gruff and somewhat rude with them. And it really probably shouldn't surprise us, I guess, because we do get caught up in the things rather than remembering what this season is all about and the love that Christ gives and God gives to us in the gift of Jesus. Home is the place where we mold and fashion little people into big people who will one day mold and fashion the world of which they are a part and will live and participate in. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all took the message of Christmas and made it a permanent part of our lives and put it into practice each day, all year long? Secondly, Jesus makes all the difference in the world. Wouldn't it be something if we would take the message of Christmas wherever we went? Now, I know that's not a popular or widely accepted today. We're being told all the time that you can't mix the church and state, that somehow you've got to put your faith in a box and only take it out on Sunday mornings. You're not supposed to pray in school. You're not supposed to talk about God at work. So much for freedom of speech. Politically correct censorship runs rampant these days. If not head on, it's by cultural pressure. But for many of us, That's really hard to do. I really believe that if people have been touched by the message of Christmas, that they have to be a Christian everywhere, all the time. It's not something you can put on and take off. It's who they, it's who you, it's who we become if it's real and genuine. You just can't help but be that. It doesn't check the calendar. It doesn't punch a clock to make sure it's okay. Rules and regulations may try to restrict us, but we need to take Jesus with us wherever we go, whenever we go. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we would take Jesus into the marketplace, into the workplace, to the school and on television, wherever we might go, and not leave him in that manger? What a difference he could make. Think about it. Think about this with me and see if there's any sense in this. When it's convenient and or people don't know what else to do or say, praying is acceptable. Think about it. It's even encouraged. Maybe some of you know that are sports fans, when DeMar Hamlin, a football player, had a cardiac arrest right in the middle of a field during an NFL football game, then it was okay to pray. It was all right to pray then and say, our thoughts and prayers go out for this young man. Even on the news, when there are natural disasters or wars going on, then it's okay to pray. Then it's okay to observe moments of silence and seek God. So I guess it's okay if things are bad enough to invite God into the situation because maybe those who don't honor him will find it less offensive. Maybe. But not only in those situations, but in all areas of life, if we shared the message of Christmas and the love of God, what a significant difference that would make What a significant difference God would make. Thirdly, Jesus makes all the difference in our lives. 
Finally, if we take Jesus into our homes, if we take Jesus with us to our jobs and to our schools and to all our activities, then he becomes the solid solid foundation on which we can build our lives. There are people preaching what I believe today is a false doctrine that says if you become a Christian, then God will take care of everything for you. You won't have to be concerned about anything because God will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise from that day on. I don't believe the Word teaches that. So, my question is, if that's true, what does it say when you aren't healthy? What does it say when you're not rolling in dough? And I don't mean to make cookies or anything. And what does it say when we make some foolish choices? Life happens. And I beg your pardon, as Do- was it Dolly who said, I never promised you a rose garden? Was that Tammy Wynette? I can't remember. One of them. Lynn Anderson. I don't have any of it right. Anyway. God never promised us a rose garden. It wasn't easy. Think about it. It wasn't easy for his own son. And his son was perfect. It wasn't easy for his own son who was perfect. He paid the ultimate price, sacrificing and demonstrating his love for us by paying for our sin. You see, some folks are making that the foundation of their faith, this faith, not faith, faith, this prosperity gospel thing. And then when their ship doesn't come in, or come rolling in, or things don't happen in a name and claim it sort of way, and things aren't all coming up roses, then they lose their faith. But God never made that promise to us. He didn't promise that, think about it, the parents of of Jesus. He didn't promise it to Mary and Joseph. Sometime after Christmas came the wise men, and that was exciting. But then soon came the time of hardship for Mary and Joseph. They had to flee from Bethlehem to Egypt, not an easy journey. As it says in Matthew 2, 13 to 16, 19 to 23, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. And when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. So, when they finally made it to Nazareth and made it their home, do you think that life for them was a bed of roses? I'm sure that wasn't the case. They worked. They paid bills. They bought food and went through all the monotonies of life and hardship. Living in a conquered land, under the iron fist of Rome, they must have been worried at times and anxious, maybe even afraid. God never promised them a rose garden, never promised to Joseph and his family a rose garden. The fact is this. That at some point, at some place, Joseph drops out of the scene altogether. We don't even know what happened to him. We don't know how or when he died. But somewhere along the way, Mary found herself without a husband, without a father at home for her children, and that was tough in biblical times. Life wasn't easy. It was hard. And I wonder if she felt that God had forgotten all about them. So the question is, how about us? We have our problems too, don't we? We've shed tears. We've been touched by death and illness, struggles, and hardships. <clears throat> we face financial troubles. Life's not always been easy, and at times it's just hard. But Jesus in our lives is the one thing that makes all the difference, that gives us this solid foundation, the strength to endure, and not only overcome, but to do so with joy as we live life to the full. So, the real work of Christmas is now just starting. You see, when the 26th of December happens, Christmas isn't over. This Christmas is a reminder that we're called to something so much more than a four weeks of Advent. 
so much more than a season of warm fuzzies. But instead, we're called to a way of life in Jesus Christ. Living and sharing his message with the world around us each and every day. A challenge to bring, share, peace, hope, joy, love, and Jesus to and with everyone with which we come into contact. Howard Thurman wrote, When the song of the angels stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and the princes are home, the shepherds are back with their flock, then the real work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to visit the prisoner, to rebuild the nation, to bring peace among sisters and brothers, to make music in the heart. That is the real work of Christmas. Yes, in a couple of weeks, the calendar will remind us that we probably should take down the Christmas tree and put away the decorations into storage for another year. In just over a week, probably all the presents will be unwrapped and the suspense and excitement gone or seriously dwindling. But may the music linger. May the music linger. May the Christmas message take root and grow in our heart to be shared with others. May our hearts be characterized by peace, goodwill, hope, joy, and the love of Jesus. May they be a part of us forever, so much so, or to the point that we can't contain it all. But we must live it and share it because we can't hold it in. It's literally who we are, or figuratively. Maybe all of our homes should be filled with the smells, sounds, and excitement of Christmas always and forever. May we take this message with us so that the world may be touched by it as we have been touched by it. Every person on the face of the earth has a need to be loved. We all want to be loved. It's one of the greatest gifts God was seeking to give at Christmas. Jesus coming to earth to demonstrate God's love for us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Christmas is an expression of God's love for the world when love personified in the person of Jesus came down. You know, we learn a lot about God and his love when we get married and become a parent. It's miraculous how love just grows and keeps multiplying. I love my wife. I love my kids. They're such blessings of God's love to me. I love these people. He's blessed me with so much that it's painful. How do I mean that? Well, you know, when they hurt, don't you hurt? When they hurt, don't you hurt? And you just want to make it better? And you're willing to sacrifice almost anything to make their pain cease. Or perhaps if you could take their place and endure it for them. My guess is that you can relate on some level. I want to see them and be with them and be part of the li their lives as they become so much as they become so much a part of mine. I love them even when they hurt my feelings. I want to give them gifts and I want to bless them. So, I'm just a man, completely imperfect. So just imagine how perfect how our perfect loving God feels about us. Just imagine if he can. It's almost beyond our grasp. One of the things that we learn at Christmas time is that God is not a nameless, faceless, higher power. Jesus came to reveal to us God, came to reveal his heart and his character. Jesus showed us God's love that we may fully, more fully love and relate to him. God knows your name. God loves you. And he does so more perfectly than I am capable of loving my wife, children, grandchildren, and family. Others will or may reject you. Someone at your work, perhaps your spouse, your parents, your child, your friends. God will not reject you. God's love for you is deeper and wider than you can possibly imagine, grasp, or even believe. Jesus is the gift of unconditional love given to the world. You know, any of us can get off track. Small, poor decisions can lead to bigger, worse ones until we don't know how we got into such a mess. And we don't recognize the person that we become, the person that stares back at us in the mirror. It's possibly then that virtually everyone else will walk away from us or leave us to our own choices and their results. And that's when we feel rejected. But Jesus, 
who knows everything you've ever done, will not reject you. Jesus spent most of his life in ministry with people who were broken, just like us. Jesus tells us, he calls to us saying, I still believe in what you could be, what you will be. I will forgive you and give you a new heart and a new life. Mary and Jesus, Joseph, Mary and Joseph, each were told the child born at Christmas was to be named Jesus, which means God, stay, God saves. Well, gang, Jesus still saves. Jesus still saves. Christmas and the message of Christmas is that we celebrate the birth of the one who brings mercy and forgiveness and new life towards sinners. This morning, God's invitation is extended to you. If you have never experienced God's love, if you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then we invite you to make that decision for yourself here this morning. And if you're ever searching for a church to call home, well, we invite you to be part of God's family here at the Eden Church. Let's take the touch of Christmas with us. May it just ooze out of us. May we not be able to contain it. May it be the good news that we can't wait to share. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer.